Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nira Shaw, the director here at the Maine CDC. I'm delighted this afternoon to be joined by Governor Janet Mills, as well as DHHS Commissioner Jean Lambrew. We're eager to be able to provide an update on where we are with respect to COVID-19 for all across the state of Maine for today, Wednesday, November 25th, 2020. I'll provide a quick update on where things stand from an epidemiological perspective. I'll then turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew for, for, for some announcements on her end, and then we'll turn things over to Governor Mills. And I begin, unfortunately, today's update on yet another series of sad notes. Maine CDC has received the report of an additional individual who has passed away with COVID-19. He was a man in his 80s from Somerset County, and his death comes one day after Maine CDC received reports of 12 people who died with COVID-19 just yesterday, we received those reports. I'd like to take a moment to, to extend our deepest condolences to the families, friends, and communities of all of these individuals who have died with COVID-19 during this time of their grief, especially during a week where we all gather to celebrate what connects us all whether we gather in person or this year virtually. Right now, across the state of Maine, there are a total of 11,027 individuals with COVID-19, an increase of 228 cases since yesterday. Of those, 9,916 individuals have confirmed COVID-19 and 1,111 have probable cases of COVID-19. As I mentioned a moment ago, we've recorded the death of another individual, bringing the total of the total number of individuals to 190 who have died with COVID-19. Cumulatively, 678 individuals have been hospitalized, and just in the past 30 days alone, 191 people have been hospitalized with COVID-19. Right now, at this very moment. 105 people are hospitalized with COVID-19 this holiday week alone. Of those 105 who are currently in the hospital, 46 of them are in the intensive care unit, 59 of them are in non-intensive care unit beds, and 11 of them are on ventilators. Among yesterday's cases, 21% were among individuals from York County, and 16% were among individuals from Penobscot and Cumberland counties each. And among all of our cases, a total of 1,546 individuals are healthcare workers. I'd like to take a second now to talk about some of the outbreaks that Maine CDC has opened up just in the past 48 hours. Just today, we have opened investigations into an outbreak at Bangor High School, where we are aware of three cases, at the Kamier School of Dance in Auburn, where we are aware of three cases, at the Business Office of Central Maine Medical School uh, Center, where we are aware of three cases. And again, I'd like to stress there that that is the Business Office of CMMC. We do not believe that any of the patient care units of CMMC are involved. That is the Business Office. And again, where we are aware of three cases, at Donna's Daycare in Lewiston, three cases. At the Island Nursing Home in Stonington on Deer Isle, five cases. At Somerset Primary Care in Skowhegan, three cases. And at South Portland High School, four cases. These new investigations for outbreak and epidemiological assessment come on top of three additional investigations we opened yesterday, all three of which were at schools. Yesterday, we opened an investigation at Auburn Middle School with three cases, at Brewer High School also with three cases, and finally, three cases at Foxcroft Academy. As we always do during these investigations, our goal is to try to determine what needs these various entities may have, be it from an infection control perspective, a testing perspective, or to the extent that they are healthcare providers from a PPE perspective, as well as providing them guidance and best practices on how to navigate the various challenges that outbreaks present, all with an eye 
toward reducing any possible transmission as well as keeping those who have been tested as positive as safe as possible. Finally, a couple of metrics with respect to where we stand on testing. Right now, the seven-day test positivity rate in Maine stands at 2.78%, and our testing volume in Maine stands at 696 PCR tests that are being conducted for every 100,000 people in Maine. That's where things stand from an epidemiological perspective. Commissioner Wambrew, I'll turn things over to you. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I'm excited to announce that Governor Mills is dedicating more than half a million dollars in coronavirus relief funds to extend home deliver meals to older Mainers and caregivers. Meals on Wheels and similar programs have been providing essential food and nutrition for Maine people staying at home during the pandemic. Additionally, these programs provide social interaction and wellness visits. Especially during challenging times, this connection to another caring individual can be a lifeline for older Mainers. Maine's Area Agencies on Aging, or AAAs, have rapidly expanded these programs, both through directly delivering meals themselves and community partnerships due to CARES Act funding. That funding, which, received, was, which was received in the spring, is running out. They will use these new funds to stretch the initial awards into the new year, allowing them to maintain current levels and meal deliveries further into 2021. The number of older adults and caregivers receiving home delivered meals and the number of home delivered meals itself has doubled during the pandemic to more than 5,500 people and 102,000 meals provided in the month of October alone. As people across Maine prepare to safely enjoy Thanksgiving, we extend our gratitude to Maine's Area Agencies on Aging and their volunteers who help Maine seniors age with dignity and nutrition. And with that, I'll turn it over to Governor Mills. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Lambrew. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Today, will, today is a Wednesday, tomorrow is Thanksgiving, as you know. Tomorrow will be a Thanksgiving like none other that we've ever endured or experienced. Our nation and state are, are changing day by day. Our country is adapting to a major transition in national go governance, addressing continuing economic challenges and trying to keep families healthy and alive in the face of a deadly national pandemic. At the same time, we here in Maine are mourning our four fishermen lost at sea. We await the rebuilding of the digester following the explosion at the Pixel Mill last April. We mourn the loss of jobs that followed that explosion. We grieve the lives lost, savings depleted, food and shelter wanting for thousands of families across our state who were victims of the unexpected downturn in our economy caused by this pandemic. Still, we give thanks. Cicero said, Quote, gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all others. There is much to be thankful for. In a year that has been so trying for so many, we've also seen kindness, innovation, and collaboration, and the very best of humanity here and elsewhere. I give thanks for the hundreds of ballot clerks, registrars, poll workers, and volunteers who conducted a general election for the first time during a pandemic and did so smoothly, efficiently, successfully, and accurately, accommodating nearly 600,000 absentee voters and a turnout of about 75% of all Maine voters. I give thanks to the businesses and individuals that volunteered in so many ways during this, these past few months of the pandemic, to the more than 250 food banks across the state, the backpack programs, the school bus drivers and parents who made sure that families got nutritious food even when classrooms were closed. To main source machining, a barbecue manufacturer who pivoted to make secure drop boxes, ballot drop boxes to allow people to vote without risking exposure to the virus. To main distilleries like Sazerac, main distilling, who turned liquor vats into hand sanitizer makers. 
to Flowfold Company and others making face masks for all of us. American Roots as well, to Bangor Savings for helping us connect school kids to the internet, to L.L. Bean for providing space, call center personnel, PPE, to IDEX for creating a new COVID test that has been such a lifesaver for our state, to the Chamber of Commerce for their PSAs, and to Lee Auto for, for, for producing some terrific public service ads to inform people of all ages about masking, and to Tim Sample and rap singer Spose for appearing in those ads. I'm grateful too for the members of my cabinet, like Commissioner Lambrew and others, and my staff, those who have confronted daily crises, always brainstorming, solving problems, and saving lives every day. I give thanks too for the more than 20,000 school teachers and staff who've adapted in hundreds of ways to make sure that truly no child is left behind and who've become the face of courage, structure and compassion for every school child. I applaud the thousands of parents as well who are juggling work, childcare and school schedules who put on a brave face every day to allay the fears and anxieties of children, putting food on the table and helping with homework and paying rent and mortgage and planning a financial future, holding onto a job and raising the next generation of adults. These super moms and super dads are everywhere and for them, we are all grateful. I give thanks for childcare providers, people like Nicole Hoagland who cares for the children of frontline workers and medical professionals without whom our healthcare facilities could not exist. She too, and others like her, are lifesavers. I'm particularly grateful for healthcare workers across the state who've held the hands of desperate patients, forcing oxygen into people's lungs and caring for them to the very end. Today, we learned that 1,546 healthcare workers have been diagnosed with COVID-19. Some are experienced nurses, CNAs, and others on whom we depend for basic care all across our state. One of those people is Dr. David Hyde, an internal medicine doctor in Western Maine. He was diagnosed with COVID-19 and pretty soon his entire family were afflicted, including kids home from college for the weekend. Quote, as a family, he said, We've experienced nearly every symptom, headache, fevers, body aches, shortness of breath, rapid heart rate, chills, congestion, cough, nausea, eye pain, diarrhea, extreme fatigue, loss of taste and smell. That's what the Hydes wrote publicly. Quote, for us, it was just a few weeks of terribleness, but for many families, it has had a far more permanent effect. We count ourselves as the lucky ones as no one truly knows exactly who will succumb to this virus. Bottom line, they said, the virus is real. It's highly cont contagious. It's virulent. It's in Maine. It's right here. It's been nearly eight months since we announced the very first person in Maine to die with coronavirus. That person was Kirk Kelsey, an author, historian, descendant of the history-making Washburn family from Livermore, Maine, which included Governor Israel Washburn, who led the state during the first two years of the Civil War, the previous state of emergency. Since Mr. Kelsey's death, another 189 people have lost their lives with COVID-19. Yesterday, the United States hit a record high number of hospitalizations and more than 2,100 coronavirus deaths with a 28% increase in child COVID cases across the country. Now, medical experts worry that Thanksgiving will turn into the, quote, mother of all super spreader events, end quote. These figures we hear every day are not mere, mere numbers on a page the sick and dying, the desperately ill people and the lives lost. They are not meaningless statistics. Every one of them is an individual with a story like you and me and your friends and your family. People like Tom Flack, first selectman of the town of Morrill, a kind and gentle man, a natural born leader who 
who died last month within only days of catching the virus. People like Jerry McLean of Cherryfield, a talented musician, an ambulance driver, an active member of his Shriners group and Maine Masonic Charity Foundation, someone who loved helping children. He's been taken from us. People like Mary Hughill of Madison, who was an avid birder and adventurer, who died from the virus after catching it from someone whose family member attended a certain wedding in East Millinocket. And then survivors like Dennis Bailey, who endured three weeks of agonizing treatment in an ICU and who wrote about his battle with COVID-19. Quote, <clears throat> quote, the scariest thing about this disease is not knowing, he said. Some people are sick for a few days and go home. Others are in the hospital for more than a month. Some don't make it. So it's a waiting game, end quote. Scary. Scary enough that everyone in this state and everyone in this nation should pay attention, listen up, and do everything possible to avoid the fate that nearly 11,000 people in Maine have faced confronting this virus. We are all family. Tomorrow is the Thanksgiving holiday, and across Maine, people will pause in gratitude and some in grief over the events of the last year. Maine people have always taken care of each other, no matter what, and today and this week is no different. We know that some vaccines are showing promise. We're told that by people in Washington. And some of them may receive emergency approval within a few weeks. But realistically, no matter how you cut it, it will be months before a vaccine is manufactured in sufficient doses and distributed in sufficient numbers to protect the population of our state or our nation. The fact is, Returning to normal life sometime next year first requires us to survive the holidays this year. Quote, two to 3,000 deaths a day times a couple of months, and you're approaching a real stunning number of deaths, Dr. Fauci told the news yesterday. But he noted, quote, it isn't inevitable. We can blunt the curve, he said, by wearing masks, washing hands, social distancing until the newly announced coronavirus vaccines are widely available. We normally gather with friends and family during the holiday season to show how much we care. This year we're staying apart to show each other how much we really do care for our families and friends and for ourselves in our state and country. To the main people who are listening, it's not fair that so much has been placed on your shoulders these last few months and to those who've already lost a loved one, these upcoming holidays may be unbearable, but you're not alone. We are all family. We will get through this together. To all main people, I'm thankful for how you have adapted to keep us all safe. Please hang in there, wait. Hope is on the horizon. At the conclusion of the book, the Count of Monte Cristo, Alexandre Dumas wrote, quote, live then and be happy and never forget that all human wisdom is contained in these two words, wait and hope. So as we wait and we hope, we wear a mask, we watch our distance, we wash our hands, keep the faith, we will get through this and we will have so much more to be thankful next Thanksgiving, keeping Cicero's words in mind that gratitude is the highest virtue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Governor Mills. Um, we will take a couple of questions this afternoon and I'll turn it over to Brian Sullivan at WABI to kick us off. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Shaw. Um, I'll start off with a question that anybody can answer, I suppose, if they like. I'm looking at a study that came out of uh, a group of researchers from Northwest, Northwest Eastern and, and Harvard, and it's uh, about Massachusetts residents, and it cites um, some lax behavior by people in Massachusetts for uh, contributing to that second wave, and it also says it's unlikely that the current measures of the mass government uh, will substantially bend the growth of the curve of the disease there. Um, I guess I think you could draw parallels to Massachusetts and Maine if things persist in the state like they're currently going. I guess what's next for the state of Maine? Uh, where do we where do we go from here? 
Um, you know, uh, Brian, I'll, I'll just comment on the study itself uh, really quickly and then uh, turn it over to others. Uh, you know, the study, like so many others, was taking a look at different scenarios and hypotheticals and map models and planning sessions to try to project one of many different courses that the virus could take. Uh, according to uh, papers and, and surveys that have been put forth, uh, some of which have been reported in, in, for example, in the Washington Post, mask wearing in Maine and uh, has, has been quite high and quite robust. I don't recall exactly where it stood relative to Massachusetts, but I think this is all the more reason, Brian, where we don't need to resign ourselves to the fate that the paper suggests, which is to say that, uh, th that it's too late to get a hold on things. We still very much have the opportunity to help put a lid on things by doing things like wearing a mask. So although the projections in that paper were dire, they are not set in stone. We still have within our ability to change the course of the direction we're going. And I'll add on what's next. We do have, relative to most other states, a pretty robust set of protections. Our policies about gathering limits, our mask requirements, our policies are fairly robust. That said, we always are looking to see what else is out there, what might work, and what else we might change. We have nothing to announce today, but that is an ongoing activity that we conduct to make sure that we're keeping people safe whenever we can. Uh, I'm going to turn next to I just one more question. I apologize. Oh, yeah, I sure, Brian. Jump in. Um, and uh, the follow up here, uh, or a separate question, is we received a statement from uh, Northern Light Health that they lost a, a team member uh, with uh, COVID 19. They acquired the, the illness through community exposure. Um, to your knowledge, is that the first person in the healthcare field to pass away with the virus in the state? Uh, Brian, we, we, we received a similar uh, report in, in our daily communications with Northern Light. Uh, our hearts go out to the loss of any individual who has passed away in this situation being a healthcare care provider. The, the ripple effect, the reverberations uh, are felt far and wide in the community. We are making sure that the details that we have square with, uh, with the details that they have. So at this time, uh, I can't confirm that. But again, our epidemiology team and our medical officers are making sure that all the details square between our understanding and what they reported to us. Can't confirm it at this time, but that doesn't diminish the difficulty and the sorrow that we have for the loss. Let me add, if I may, that nationally, there have been a number of news stories about doctors, nurses, CNAs nationwide losing their lives to this virus. No one's immune. Uh, I'm going to turn things next over to Steve Batari at WMTW. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Our question today is for Governor Mills. Governor Mills, I wanted to ask you about the 9 p.m. limit placed on certain businesses. Uh, now, it's not just our state doing these types of curfews. There's been more reporting in the last couple of days about these curfews. Several prominent infectious disease epidemiologists told USA Today they're actually expressing concern that these measures could encourage more risky behaviors. Uh, epidemiologists at George Mason University points to the fact that the curfews often condense people visiting into a narrow, narrower period of time, could lead to more crowding and potential exposures, or also lead to more private gatherings versus people doing it in public, where there are these guidelines in place. Uh, so I guess the question is, was this taken into account when enacting the measure, and what was the science that superseded those concerns? Thanks for the question. Uh, I, I can't comment on the George Mason uh, folks and what they've said, but I know that you know, here in Maine, most people eat dinner well before nine o'clock in the evening. Um, I don't expect that that's going to hamper that the business closing, early business closing is going to hamper people's ability to eat if they do wish to eat out. And I think more and more people are actually taking, getting takeout or curbside delivery of food and other goods um, because most people are con very concerned about engaging in public um, gatherings. And it's not, it, it's the gatherings as opposed to the locale that we're looking at, whether it's private or public. Uh, and I think that uh, we had long discussions about this before we um, issued that guidance and that uh, business closing. Um, and it was based on the fact that people do tend to get together, um, particularly like in drink drinking establishments, for instance, and including restaurants after nine o'clock uh, and people let down their guard. And we've got people home from college, a lot more visitors in the state over the holidays. 
And there, there is that tendency, look, I've lived here most of my life. I mean, um, there is that tendency to go out in the evening and you kind of let down your guard and um, to get to wear a mask or think that because you're in an eating establishment or some other uh, venue that you don't have to wear a mask and you don't have to keep your distance when in fact, it's all the more important to do so. And, and Steve, I, I just, I, I could totally concur with what Governor Mills noted. But we are always thinking about not just the, the, the potential outcomes, but always evaluating potential unintended outcomes as well. And so we did contemplate these, these types of scenarios here. I think in our situation, the, the concern that was most prominent in our mind was the situations that we know have generated disproportionate outsized amounts of transmission. That is gatherings of individuals later in the evening who, as Governor Mills noted, may not have their face coverings on, who may be in tightly more crowded locations. Those are the gatherings that tend to occur later on in the evening that we were particularly concerned about. To the extent those individuals may, for example, comprise college students who are coming back into town and reconnecting with their friends, that risk is magnified depending on where they're coming from. So that was really the focus of this. As you note, if folks are in, in dining establishments earlier on, they are wearing face coverings and, and, and seated and not necessarily walking around and such things. There may be a risk, but it's lower. The risk we're concerned about is the risk that materializes later in the evening. Thank you. And a brief follow-up, uh, Governor Mills, if I may. Over in Vermont, Governor Scott instituted a, a ban on multi-family household gatherings indoors or out. Is that anything that's being considered here in our state at this time? Uh, thanks. Banning indoor gatherings. We've made strong recommendations against indoor gatherings of multiple households. The national CDC, uh, for instance, recommends limiting the total number of people you invite to allow anybody from different households to stay six feet apart if you do insist on having a gathering. We're asking people not to have gatherings, even on a great day like Thanksgiving Day. We're asking people not to have big meals, not to invite friends and family, extended family over, but to remain within their own households. So mandating that, uh, I, I like Phil Scott, he's a great guy. He's done a lot of different things, different than what we've done in Maine. We've done what we think is best here. We're act actively discouraging those kinds of gatherings, um, but I'm not gonna be peering in the window to see, if, see how many people from different households are in your dining room. <laughs> okay, thank uh, you, Governor Mills. I'm gonna turn things over to Rebecca Stefanski at News Center. Hi, thank you for taking my call. I have a question for Governor Mills and then also for you, Dr. Shaw. Um, I guess I'll start with Governor Mills. Um, if it becomes in the best interest of public safety to return to some sort of stay safer at home mandate that we had earlier in the pandemic, can we do that without assistance from the federal government? And how can we truly hold Congress accountable for any further delay? And what can you say to the people of Maine who, like you said, have largely been very patient and understanding that this is, everyone has been trying their best? Thank you. Well, as I said at the outset, things are changing every day here in the state of Maine and nationally. We're looking at a new administration taking over within less than two months. We're looking at a transition finally taking place. And we're looking at Congress. I mean, I've spoken to, uh, in the last few weeks, I've spoken to every member of Congress, every member of our delegation, and we'll be speaking with them again short, soon about the needs of the state of Maine in particular. Uh, and um, um, what I perceive, and, and they've all been out there on the campaign trail and otherwise listening to people as well. I think they pretty well know that we absolutely have to have another stimulus package as soon as possible. Uh, with people's, with about 35,000 people losing their unemployment benefits uh, just after Christmas, just after the holidays, before the beginning of the year, uh, with people, um, uh, losing SNAP benefits and rental assistance come January, some of them. Um, things are dire. Uh, and the, uh, the, the greater needs of children who don't have internet that we're trying to address, um, things that cost money, uh, we're trying to address with the dollars that we have. Um, the Congress knows, our delegation knows, and I hope that the entire Senate and Senate 
majority, current majority leader McConnell comes to understand the frightful necessity of all states and all businesses in those states and all individuals having a significant form of relief in the next few weeks, not months. So can we survive in essence, a, a potential stay safer at home orders or something if that becomes necessary? And is that a consideration that maybe we can't and therefore there's hesitation to move in that direction? I'm not gonna speculate about how and when or if a so-called stay, stay at home order would be um, invoked or would be appropriate. Um, what I have said is looking back to the spring, the stay at home orders nationwide were effective. The pandemic was a new thing. And because uh, the state, state of Maine and the Congress enacted um, expanded unemployment benefits, that helped. And because the Congress enacted a PPP, a paycheck, paycheck protection program, that helped a lot of businesses and employees stay, survive those times. That doesn't exist now. The unemployment benefits are running out and the PPP has long expired. So it made it a little easier or less, less tough for people to survive um, the spring and the restrictions that many governors across the country imposed at that time. It will be a different balancing act today, this month or the end of the year, if we were to do that again. Okay, thanks, Governor. Um, and Dr. Shaw, um, my question for you um, is about a study that the US CDC um, just released and, and vaccines, um, basically that they're, they've shown a decline in antibodies over time um, in frontline healthcare workers that, and those with uh, higher responses initially uh, were likely to have antibodies and further tests. And does, we don't know if that means a decline uh, or rather if that's an increased risk of reinfection uh, at this point. But in terms of the vaccine, do we have any idea what the lasting duration of immunity might be? And could it be that this will be like flu vaccinations that we'll have to regularly be vaccinated again, if not annually? And I guess the, I'll I'll wait until you answer that, and then I have a sure. follow-up. So there's two parts of your question, but the first part and the most important part is former, uh, which is around antibodies and what they are. Antibodies are proteins that our bodies make when they are grappling with a foreign substance, be it a virus or a bacteria. And our bodies have a memory that allows us to produce high numbers of antibodies after we've been initially exposed to them. The concept of a virus, I'm sorry, of a vaccine is to, to give that body, to implant that memory in the body so that when, if, if or when it encounters that virus again, it can rapidly ramp up the level of antibodies. Antibodies naturally decline in the weeks or months after that initial exposure. That's natural and happens with any virus. The key though, is that they can be ramped back up very, very quickly after the body is exposed to that. That's called the innate memory that the immune system has. So you're correct as to the study, but we should not interpret that study to suggest that because antibodies, uh, antibody levels in healthcare workers fell, that for some reason there is not lasting immunity to the virus. Antibody levels fall no matter what happens. The key is that they can be rapidly built back up. That's what our immune system is magically good at doing. Now, what does this mean for a vaccine? It's too early to tell. There have been uh, very fervent discussions about whether any potential COVID vaccine will be a one and done type of thing, or in this case, two and done type of thing, or whether there may need to be an annual revaccination as is more common with the influenza virus. Uh, I've heard different immunologists discuss it in both ways. The last time I heard Dr. Fauci discuss this topic, which is about two weeks ago, he thought that based on the data that he was aware of at the time, it would be more like something that lasted multiple years. But candidly, Rebecca, we don't have enough data yet. We are all, of co course, hoping 
that it's not a natural an, an annual type of thing, but we won't really know until some of the longer term data come back in. Okay. Um, and admittedly, I'm no scientist, so <laughs> forgive this next question if I um, get this. But it, there's also been discussion, you know, for months now, um, but that there are different strains of the virus. Maybe there was even a significant mutation um, recently that caused it to be more contagious. Does that mean that, again, similar to the flu vaccine, that efficacy in different years is different based on what strain might be around? It's a theoretical possibility. And the key word there is theoretical. Uh, the flu virus is not a single virus. The influenza that we know and have some of us have sadly experienced is caused by any number of viruses in the influenza family that circulate and change from year to year. Not that they mutate, but some become more prominent in some years and others are less prominent in some years. That is one of the key reasons why the flu vaccine changes. Every year around uh, February, scientists take a look at what's circulating in the Southern hemisphere and make determinations about what the composition of the flu vaccine will be in the Northern hemisphere. And that has less, that has partly to do with changes, but a lot to do with just what's circulating. Right now, as it relates to the coronavirus, it's too early to tell whether any of the small genetic changes that have occurred with the virus will be such that the, the vaccine will have to be remanufactured. In the same talk I mentioned a moment ago that I was privileged to hear Dr. Fauci give, he addressed this topic and he did not think that there have been significant mutations that have generated changes in the spreadability or what's called the virulence of the virus, nor did he think that those small little point changes would affect any type of long-term effect of the vaccine. But again, as with so many things with a novel pandemic, it's going to take more time and data to tell. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. If I may, real quick, and maybe this, I hope it's real quick. Um, do you have any comment about the World Health Organization's um, recommendation that remdesivir not be used to treat uh, COVID-19? Yep, um, I will, um, I'll try to be very pithy. Um, Science is always evolving and looking at the newest and latest data. Uh, I think the World Health Organization in their analysis was looking at slightly different endpoints or so-called clinical goals than what the US FDA and researchers in the United States have been looking at. Uh, and, and so this, that is not to suggest that the drug has no value, but the, U, the World Health Organization was looking at one set of endpoints. The US FDA was looking at a slightly different set. Uh, but it's not as if one conflicted with the other. Uh, to be somewhat even pithier, uh, happy ending depends on where you start and stop the story. And the WHO was looking at different start and stop points. Okay, we can. I'll give everybody else their time. Thank you all. Yeah. Happy Thanksgiving. You, sure. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm going to turn next over to Amy Brown at WERU. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. A Northern Light Health spokesperson earlier today said that the state received one uh, weekly supply of the monoclon monoclonal antibody treatment, and then the federal government said the supply was going to be cut by half. So I have a couple of questions about that. You had initially said a few weeks ago that the state would be receiving 90 a week. Was that what was in the initial supply? And also, is this the Regeneron cocktail that just recently received emergency youth authorization for people even with mild and moderate symptoms if they are at high risk? And if so, how, what's happening with all of that and plans for distribution and prioritizing who gets it first? Sure. Uh, so the Regeneron antib monoclonal antibody just received use authorization. Uh, as you may know, just in the last 48 hours or recent days, that monoclonal antibody will not be shipped to Maine until at the very earliest of next week. Um, with respect to the Eli Lilly one, which Maine has been receiving shipments of, uh, the, the U.S. government uses a formula that they tabulate every week that determines what states will be receiving and it's based on the burden of disease in a particular state, as well as the number of individuals who are hospitalized. Well, what we have done in our allocation of this 
is almost identical to what we did in our allocation of remdesivir starting earlier this year, which is to work with hospitals to determine where the drug should be positioned initially with the understanding that if a clinician or a hospital in any other part of the state needed it, the hospitals would share it amongst themselves. So the 90 doses uh, of the Eli Lilly was what was received and that's being cut back to 45 just for uh, next week or moving uh, forward or? Uh, I'd have to check and see uh, exactly what the final determination was. Again, the calculations are made on Wednesdays and Thursdays um, by the federal government. So I'll have to check and see exactly what this week's allocation to Maine will be. And then the Regeneron will be on top of whatever you're getting from the Eli Lilly supply? That, that is correct. And that won't begin until the very earliest of next week. Both of these drugs are in extremely short supply nationwide. For example, the Eli Lilly uh, drug, there are only 300,000 total anticipated doses available uh, for the entire country. Okay. And... The number of probable cases continues going up. I think there's 10 more today than yesterday. And a while back, you had said that the state was going to stop designating during flu and uh, cold season cases as probable because it was impossible to distinguish. So will those cases eventually start going down? Has that just not started being calculated that way? Uh, no. So Amy, the what, what we decided to do was because a number of individuals who have been exposed to somebody may have another infectious disease like the cold, a probable case now requires some type of laboratory test, for example, an antigen test. Antigen tests like the Binax Now cards that we've been rolling out in partnership with Walgreens are becoming increasingly used. And so if someone tests positive on a Binax Now and has symptoms that are consistent with COVID, that's how they could be counted as a probable test. Okay, gotcha. And just one more real, I think this is a quick follow-up. Does vaccine, the immunity that you get from a vaccine or the protection you get from a vaccine, how does the length that that lasts typically compare to a natural immunity from having had the disease? It really depends. There is no one-size-fits-all rule there, Amy. Um, some vaccines can confer immunity for longer than the innate natural immunity that can happen. In some cases, it's the opposite. So there isn't a, a general rule from an immunology perspective about one being longer lasting or more durable than the other. It really does depend both on the nature of the disease, whether it's a virus, a bacteria, a fungus, or, as well as the nature of the vaccine. We will hope with the COVID-19 vaccine that the nature of the immunity is long lasting. Uh, that I know is something that immunologists and vaccine specialists are paying close attention to right now. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn over to Rose at the main monitor. Hi, thank you for taking my questions. I, I have two today. My first question is about volunteers. I understand that the number of volunteers with the CDC has increased significantly since the start of the pandemic, and they've been involved in a number of different roles related to containing the virus. I was wondering if you could say a little bit about what kind of difference these volunteers have made in Maine's COVID-19 response, and whether more volunteers will be necessary as cases surge, and as perhaps we prepare for a future vaccine rollout. Sure. Um... Let me, let me first start by just noting the fact that earlier on in the pandemic, I put out a call, Commissioner Lambrew put out a call, and Governor Mills put out a call for folks to help out as part of the response. And after each and every one of those, we saw a significant and heartwarming spike in the number of people who went to our main response website to sign up and say, I want to help. And we had individuals volunteered and were asked to serve by Maine CDC in just about every area of our response. On the, um, on the assistance with helping out with contact tracing, to help out with data analysis, to help out with logistics and warehouse operations, you name it, we asked for assistance and we got it. And as I just mentioned a moment ago, Rose, in almost every area of the response, having to be, being able to tap into volunteers, some of whom have expertise that we may not have had, was very, very helpful for our overall response. 
We don't see that slowing down. As we think about potential planning for vaccines, we will certainly be looking to support and get support from community members, be they healthcare providers, be they local officials on the ground, be they volunteers just within the community who want to help us plan and administer vaccines. I don't see that slowing down whatsoever. Great, thank you. Uh, my second question is about contact tracers. I was curious, how, how will their role change, if at all, when we eventually get to a vaccine rollout? Could they perhaps play an educational role or anything like that? We're, we're always thinking about ways that we can redeploy staff in, in the areas where they are the most essential and the most needed. The, the thing is though, Rose, even after a vaccine arrives in Maine, and even after it arrives in sufficient quantities to start vaccinating folks in the community, COVID-19 will not disappear. There's, the, the vaccine will not, sadly, I hate to say it, will not result in a fairy tale ending where the virus is vanquished and we can go back entirely to pre-COVID time. There will still be infections. There will still be flare-ups. There will still be outbreaks of COVID-19. So we will still need to have investigators and contact tracers, hopefully not anywhere near the numbers we have today, but we are thus looking to see where we can redeploy those contact tracers to help out in other areas, be it community education, maybe assistance with vaccine education, maybe assistance with just understanding where things are with COVID. It's going to be a long process for sure. Great, thank uh, you. Mm -hmm. uh, you bet, Rose. I'm gonna turn things over to Patty White next. Thanks, Dr. Shaw. Um, I've got a qu couple questions about ski areas because the season is upon us. Um, can you tell us where ski resorts fall compared to other settings in terms of their potential for becoming vectors of transmission? What are the riskiest aspects of uh, going to a ski resort? I'll just start with that first piece really qu quickly and then turn it over to Commissioner Wambrew and Governor Mills. Uh, the riskiest part uh, of, of going out for skiing is what we would think of and is, is being the lodge. It's being close to other people for duration and density. Those are the areas where transmission is the highest likelihood. Um, and, and that's what I would caution anybody uh, who, who's going out. Yep, and just we did issue a COVID-19 prevention checklist for exactly that purpose, recognizing that when you're outdoors and skiing, the odds of you being very close to somebody is low. We still do recommend when there's organized sports regarding skiing that people do wear face coverings when possible, but the real issue is the lodges. So we did put out guidance, um, and I think all of our ski lodges in the state of Maine have been interested in asking questions. And as you probably know, a couple of them have opened up, but we are watching closely to make sure that those protocols and guidelines work and get adjusted as needed. And I think the National Association and the state associations uh, skiing have been very helpful in helping draft some of those um, uh, restrictions and guidelines. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the mask requirement, who is expected to enforce that in ski areas? <clears throat> is it mostly at the eating establishments? So like other establishments, uh, there is a, a requirement that you post on the door uh, what our state rules are regarding face coverings ski lodges are public settings like other areas. Uh, we hope that the organizations do take that seriously. As a reminder, they do have the ability though to deny entry to individuals who are not wearing face coverings. The Attorney General and I issued guidance the other day just clarifying exactly what the rules are, how they can be enforced. We also are providing tools on our websites about enforcement. So we do have the expectation that individuals comply the expectations that establishments post, and they again have this option of denying entry if an individual is not wearing a face covering. Let me add, sure it's an option, but really it's a requirement because if businesses of any sort begin letting people in without masks, other people will not go there. They will lose customers, they will lose market share, no question about it. I've heard that from so many people. So it is in everyone's best interest, including the staff, the other customers, members of the public, and the businesses themselves, including ski lodges, to prevent people from coming in to their establishments without a mask. A mask is required for all to be worn in all public settings, including ski lodges and elsewhere. Thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Isha at the BDN next. 
Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Can you hear me? Yep, go ahead. Uh, so I have two questions today. Uh, one, the first one is about schools. Um, as you mentioned today, some of the state's largest school districts now have outbreaks. So um, what might have changed in, in these schools to lead to this spike in cases? Well, what's, what's happening with schools is not dissimilar from what uh, I discussed, I think it was last week, which is schools are gathering places. They are connecting points within the community. And as a result of that, what we are often seeing is that as rates of community transmission go up, just like as anywhere else in the community, there may be more cases in schools. We still have not found sustained evidence of widespread transmission of COVID-19 in schools. Instead, what we have seen is that cases are detected because of the fact that schools themselves serve as gathering points within the community, as connecting points in the community. But to be sure, the, the best way to keep rates of COVID-19 as low as possible within schools is to keep those rates of COVID-19 as low as possible in the community. One, one more quick point on that, Isha. Um, I think a week or two ago, I mentioned an analysis that Scottish education and health authorities have released that accorded with Maine's findings. Just yesterday or the day before, um, German health authorities and education authorities released a similar analysis that found what we have found in Maine and what the Scots saw, which is although cases have definitely been detected, they are largely a function of community rates of transmission as opposed to transmission within schools. But the Germans and the Scots and the Mainers, all of us are consistent with one thing, that could change. As rates of community transmission increase, there is a risk that transmission could occur, could start occurring in a sustained manner within schools. Thank you. Uh, my next question is about an article that the New York Times recently wrote. Um, they reported that uh, household gatherings are definitely causing community transmission, but might not be the source of the virus. And the article cited various uh, places like long-term care facilities and restaurants that might be actually the sources of the virus. So have you found that to be true with Maine? And if yes, um, is, the, is ki these kind of sources described consistent with what you found? Yep, I'm uh, definitely well familiar with that piece that you reference. Um, the, the headline did not quite match uh, what was contained within the text. Uh, as you note, the very second line of the article said, household transmission of COVID-19 is most definitely occurring. And I believe the author even said increasing. But the point here though, Isha, is that we should not think of COVID-19 as living in and occurring within discrete hermetically sealed silos. COVID-19 is a virus and it transmits itself all across a community. What's really been happening is an expanded life cycle of COVID where community transmission rates in the community make small household gatherings more risky. Those small household gatherings being more risky generate more community transmission, which then means that those individuals go to their workplaces in long-term care facilities or in restaurants and thus cause outbreaks, which leads to more community transmission. So my concern with the article was that it, its assumption was that these things live in discrete buckets and vacuums. That's not the case at all. What we've seen in Maine, and I think is consistent with every, in many places in the country, is that community transmission rates have gone up and that makes household gatherings more risky which makes other areas of the community more prone to outbreaks. It's a cycle and not a discrete linear thing. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm gonna turn next to Eric Russell at the Press Herald. Uh, good afternoon. Yeah. I have a couple of questions about testing. One is pretty quick. Um, Dr. Shaw, is it true that the CDC lab is not gonna be running results on Thursday and Friday of this week? Uh, our staff will be in on third on Friday, but the main CDC laboratory has been running results, has been running laboratory tests every single day without a single day off uh, for COVID-19 since early March. And so they are they are going to be taking a well-deserved day on Thanksgiving to reconnect and re-energize. They are setting everything up by the close of business today 
so that as soon as they come back in on Friday morning, before any of us gets up, the main CDC lab will be back up and running and running results. My view is that the, the staff at the main CDC laboratory have been working 18 to 20 hour days since before we even had our first case. Anyone who doesn't think that they will be doing a better job after having a couple hours off with their family, well, it's gonna be straight. You haven't run a lab before. Um, the next question I had um, had to do with the swab and send sites. I wanted to get a sense of how those are going. I know we've heard that it's been hard for asymptomatic individuals to get in and get testing, but that folks with symptoms can get in fairly quickly. And I didn't know if you could provide us uh, of an overview about that. And I also think Commissioner Lambert mentioned earlier this week that they had been reaching out to swab and send sites to offer some support. So perhaps she could touch upon that. Sure. So we do recognize that in the last week, there really has been a challenge with a lot of people seeking testing around college is kind of a journey for the semester, people potentially traveling for the holidays, even though we continue to advise people not to travel. So we have reached out to all of our sites asking them, what will it take to expand hours, to increase staff, and to really try to ensure that we open up access. And we have some great proposals. We think that some of these sites will implement them as soon as next week. But we also recognize that as Dr. Shaw said, <clears throat> this will go on longer than all of us would hope. So we are extending our support for these swab and sends into the new year. So we're always looking for new creative ways to expand access to testing. Our swab and sends have been great partners. So we are both going to potentially increase support for increased hours and increased access, as well as extend the time period for those sites. And real quick, um, Dr. Shaw, maybe you can touch upon this. Um, do you think that there's any sort of false sense of security that might be happening with people who get negative tests? Uh, I mean, there's been a lot of reports that, you know, when you test somebody who's been exposed to the virus early, there may not be enough of the virus detected for them to test positive. And so maybe they get that negative test and they let their guard down a little bit. Maybe they're not wearing their mask everywhere. Maybe they're not distancing. Do you have any sense of whether or not that's happening and whether or not that's causing any problems to speak of, particularly as we have more and more testing and people are interested in finding out if they're negative or not, um, if that's creating this dynamic? So Eric, I'm concerned about that. Um, I, I don't, I, I can't point to a, a percentage in Maine where that has occurred and thus has, has, has led to a um, you know, particular transmission event. What I can tell you is what I'm concerned about is that exact notion though, particularly as we go into a time when many folks may be traveling to other states or having visitors come to Maine to spend time with their families, believing that the negative test that they got to come into Maine or the negative test that they got before they went out is an absolute ironclad guarantee that they are safe. The test is just that. It's a snapshot of a very fast moving train of what's happening inside your body. And you're right, as it relates to this week in particular, I, as well as a number of other state health officials and epidemiologists are concerned that it will be taken as that ironclad guarantee. Is it helpful? Absolutely. But there are no guarantees in this. And so as we think about tomorrow and Friday and this weekend, as well as moving forward, the test is just that. It tells you what was happening the moment that the sample was taken. You could have been exposed the morning before you got your test, or you could be exposed the day after you got your test done. All the more reason why we can't let down our guard with the basics. Face coverings, physical distancing, avoiding crowds are just as important today as they were back in March. Thank you and happy Thanksgiving to you all. Thanks a lot, Eric. And I'm gonna round out the afternoon by handing things over to Patrick Whittle. Thank you very much and happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Um, so I have, I have two questions. One is, one is homegrown and one is from a reader. Um, my question is, um, if you could sort of speak to what's happening in the Canadian Maritimes, uh, their, their caseload is, is really almost strikingly low. And I'm curious what we could learn from them and maybe what, what they've been doing that we, that we haven't, um, if anything. 
And also the one from a reader, uh, reader has noticed these um, sort of greenhouse like sort of structures that have popped up at some restaurants that allow outdoor dining, but really it's indoor dining because they have doors and roofs and are essentially structures of their own. And the reader would, would the reader asked me, are these sort of restaurant greenhouse on the sidewalk things, are they a solution or is this like sort of kind of COVID theater where we're sort of setting up a pup tent and saying we're safe because we're here in the restaurant pup tent? And I would love your thoughts on that. All right, I'll start with both of those really quickly and then it open it up uh, as well. Um, as to the Maritimes, I, I too have been keeping very close tabs on how things are unfolding uh, with, our, with our neighbors to the north. Uh, I've talked about the experience that they had with their Thanksgiving on October 12th and the unfortunate aftermath of that. I'd like to just remind everybody that Thanksgiving for that reason, if for no other reason than what the Canadians experienced, remains a risk. Um, you're right, Patrick, up until recently, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, PEI have had lower rates and they continue to have lower per capita rates, but they have at the same time started experiencing an increase. Of course, to say nothing of Ontario and Quebec, uh, whose rates are, I think, even higher than what we've seen um, in Maine and more akin to Michigan and others. So they too are, have started to experience an increase. Uh, just the other day, uh, we got a, my team and I got a, a note from our, uh, our New Brunswick counterparts uh, because of increased outbreaks that they are seeing just across the border. So uh, although they have done uh, quite well as has Maine, they too are starting to see this increase in number of cases. So let's, um, let's hope we can all collectively keep a lid on things. Uh, as to the outdoor um, dining, I'll, I'll say two really quick things, Patrick. The first is they do come in two varieties. One is the pod that is really just intended to encompass you and your immediate diner, uh, mainly just to protect from the elements. As long as it's you and the person you're in the household, household with, that doesn't change the risk. But I too have seen larger, more expansive uh, setups that have four walls, a roof, uh, heating elements inside. Those start to look a lot like rooms and a lot less like outdoor dining. And the protections that are afforded by being outdoors with ventilation, potentially ultraviolet light, more natural spacing, those do not exist in those situations. If it's got four walls, if it's got a roof, if it does not have ventilation, it's indoors. Let me add on the Canadian issue. I um, have occasional discussions with Premier Higgs and Premier King and others across the border. And the advantage, one major advantage they have is that they have a federal government who's willing to support families continuously. They provided long-term economic supports for those businesses who've had to close and for families who cannot go to work because of various restrictions. And uh, at one point you could not travel from one province to another province. The provin provincial borders were blocked. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's changed. But uh, when I talked to Premier Higgs, last I talked with him, they had had no COVID deaths and only a handful of COVID uh, cases, any diagnoses. So I envy them in many ways but they have also had a different economic environment to work in that's allowed people to stay apart and still survive economically, financially. And, and Patrick, just a clarifying point. When I said that those are indoors, I'm thinking about it from a public health perspective, from an epidemiological perspective, we really have to think hard about how much protection is afforded when a structure has four walls and a roof. Just a, a question that I think we all need to grapple with as we think about assessing risk going forward. So just a clarifying point there. Um, Governor Mills, Patrick's question was the last one, so I will turn things back over to you. Great, thank you. And I wanna refer back to a question uh, by Isha and she talked about schools and it occurred to me, we, we know this, we keep thinking it, we keep saying it, but it should be clear to everybody. And you mentioned it, it's not about the sector, it's not about the venue per se, it's about community spread. And everything we do in the community, when we don't take precautions that we know we have to do, we have to take for our own sake and our families and, and neighbors' sakes, um, there may be a school closing as a result of that behavior. 
there may be a closing of a clinic or part of a hospital. We may not be able to have elective medical procedures anymore. There may not be staff to take care of people in the ICUs. Everything we do and don't do sometimes is connected to every other part of our communities. Are the things that we depend upon so much every day. So those are things I wanna make sure we keep in mind. I thanked a lot of people at the beginning of this. I, I didn't actually thank Dr. Shah, but every day I get notes and emails and I know he gets some of the emails that are always, and he's got his own, not his, but somebody's got a thank you Dr. Shah Facebook page. So um, I, I envy him for that, but thank you Dr. Shah for all these regular briefings. And I know it takes a lot of work and you have such a great, great amount of patience. I wanna thank you for your service to the state of Maine. And I wanna thank the people of the state of Maine again, um, you know, we know we have a dangerous killer among us and the killer's name is COVID-19. The people are trying very hard to keep it at bay. And I, I wanna thank the people of Maine who are caring for each other, those businesses and shopkeepers and, and um, supermarket checkout people and clerks and people who've been on the front lines of this pandemic from the very beginning and the overworked aides and people in assisted living and, and um, group homes business owners who've lost market share have taken a big hit on behalf of the people of Maine, and their fellow citizens, and all the friends and neighbors who have extended acts of kindness, great and small. I'm so proud of our state right now, of every one of you. I thank you and I hope you all have a peaceful, safe, and hopeful Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, Governor. Thanks, Commissioner. Have a good afternoon, everyone.